<laughs> now, this this is a story. This this is a question which you you, you get asked so often. How do you come to be a hundred? Now you're expected to kind of think up some ridiculous, funny things, which mean nothing. But I now just say to them, I'm under good management. My name is Eric Tweedale. I live in Peninsula Village at Umina. I am 100 years old. I turned 100 on the 5th of May this year gone. Uh, I was born in, actually in England, a big textile industry town called Rochdale, only 10 miles out of Manchester. It mustn't have been a very nice place to live. Ch chimneys popping up everywhere, black smoke, the long rows of tenement houses, uh, and uh, everybody working in the mills. My father and mother, they, they, they did work in the mills at, from 12 years old. Had they stayed in England, I would have worked in the mills also. Thank goodness they decided to come to Australia. We came, of course, by a ship, everybody. All the migrants in those days came by a ship. The population of the whole of Australia was just over five million people. And it wasn't a land of milk and honey. Things were getting very tough. Employment was hard to get. My father, having worked in the mills of Lancashire, came out here as an unskilled worker. And so he was looking around for unskilled employment, which he found working for William Arnott's, the biggest, the, the biscuit people. Mum and Dad bought a place in Marylands, just a cheap little place. And uh, it was just wonderful to bring up kids because there was vacant land all over. But there was more vacant land than there was building. Over the, the area was full of poultry farms, dairy farms, brick pits, and uh, really, as far as the children were concerned, we had a wonderful time. We went to school barefooted. And we thought that was great. Uh, we, we had such tons of room to move around in. Meanwhile, Mum and Dad, uh, they were doing the doing it pretty tough. A few years after that, of course, the depression set in, and of course that was that was an absolute terrible uh, time in the history of Australia, not only in Australia but worldwide, really. William Arnott sacked nobody right throughout the depression, but they did lessen their working hours. So it could be that my dad would work four days a week instead of five, sometimes three days a week. It got us out of the the poverty, uh, the, the real depression. We, we still handled it pretty well, but we didn't have any to put away for a rainy day, I can tell you that. I don't think my dad ever had a bank account until the day he died, he lived from day to day. I was a very average student. From the day I think I was born, I was meant to be a sports person. I left school at 14 to go and find a job somewhere. I had to because I was getting a big kid. I was eating a lot of food. I was keeping the, poor, the family poor. So, I had to go out and get a job for myself, which uh, I got a job with Anthony Hordens. At 14 years of age, I started at 12 shillings and threepence, very close to a dollar thirty per week. When I was 15, I was a big lad. I was six, over six foot tall and uh, weighed about 13 stone. I met a man called Bill Surratti. Bill Cerati 
was the international front row forward, one of the finest forwards Australia has ever seen. So he said to me, Eric, have you ever considered playing rugby union? I said to him, Mr. Cerati, I've never even seen the game played. It's not, that's only played in top high schools and GPS schools, but uh, I've, I've never seen the game played. He said, well, he said, you're big and ugly enough. He said, would you, would you like me to take you over to Parramatta Rugby Union Club on Tuesday night for training? We'll see what we can make of you. And uh, by the time the season was finished, I was really wrapped in this game. And uh, by the time I was 17, I was a permanent member of the, the Parramatta district side. And at 19, I was the youngest player picked in the only representative game played at the start of the war in 1940. There was no representative played from then on until 1946, another five years. I served in the Navy for four years. By this time, I'm no longer the, the kid on the block type of person. I'm 25 years of age with a burning desire to play for Australia. After playing the interstate games against Queensland, uh, I made the Wallaby team to go to New Zealand. How did I get to know that I was to become a Wallaby? I was working for the Shell Company. I knocked off work that day. I bought a paper at Wynyard Station, went down to Wynyard, got on the train, sat down, opened up the paper, always started at the back page, which was a sporting page. And there was the team to go to New Zealand in the back page of the, and there, my name was was there. And uh, it, it said that this article said that the, the chosen players will train at Sydney Cricket Ground number two at four o'clock Tuesdays and Thursdays until the team goes away. We went over to New Zealand on by Air New Zealand on Sunderland flying boats. I was told to be at Rose Bay Terminal by six o'clock the following Monday morning, it was just after the war. Very few people had cars, and if they had cars, they had very little petrol, it was all rationed. I said, how am I going to get from Guildford or Marylands to Rose Bay by six o'clock? They as good as said, well, that's your problem, mate. <laughs> but anyway, you've got to remember that the game hasn't been played for eight years. So we don't know what to expect, really. We've got a team that's half full of kids and half full of soldiers or servicemen. We've never seen the All Blacks play. Eight years is a long time. The New Zealand team had been, to New, had been to England and they'd just come back from a tour of England. They were toughened, they were hardy, they were recognised international players and their passion is so great that it makes them a very difficult team to beat, whether it be 1946 or 2021. We played the first test down in Dunedin, we got beaten 33 to 8. Uh, it was a real drubbing, really. Uh, uh, but we weren't expecting to win, really. We played the second test at Eden Park in Auckland, and we got beaten too, 14 points to 10. And we scored two tries to the All Blacks one. So this is giving you some indication that this team of ours was 
with all its inexperience, was learning very quickly. And the team that they took to England was a good team, one of the best teams ever to represent Australia on a long tour. So we played 30 matches, we won 25. We convincingly beat Scotland, Ireland, and we beat England 11 to nil. As I say, Wales beat us 6 to nil, two penalty goals to nil. And didn't have a try scored against us in the four test matches. No other international team has ever done that. We, at our first match, when we went to England in 47, this is a beautiful photo, that's Charlie East, is the winger. We were convinced that we scored tries. Their way of playing football was to combine the two or three. They, they had tries, conversions and field goals. Now that type of football wasn't the way we played at all. You can imagine there's been a scrum over here and the ball is whipped out across the back line. There's the outside centre there and Charlie East is. Uh, th th they, they liked our uh, type of play. And uh, slowly but surely, over the years that have gone past, th they now play more of a game like the way we used to play it. It's not, there's not a tight forward until you get someone way back here. Yeah. Of course, in, in those days, in 46, 47, 47, 48, the, the, the game was patterned. We, we played to a pattern. We had, we, we had a scrum here, we had a line out there, the, the ball was supposed to go out to the winger, and the winger went down there, passed it back in, picked up the forwards here, and away we went. But today, you were, the, 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 the forwards and the backs get mixed up together. We had a fellow by the name of Roger Cornforth. He, was, he loved to get out amongst the backs. He was a breakaway. But they wouldn't pick him on Australian side because he had no business to be out there in the first place. If, if I went down to Sydney and spoke to the, the powers that be down there, they'd probably say that uh, rugby has been played more now than ever before because, they were, because of the of the inclusion of women's rugby and the popularity of the second side. It's quite apparent that women's rugby is here to stay. They've, been, they've played it for a number of years, but in the doldrums, you might say. Now they're, uh, they're up and going and uh, they're quite a force to be reckoned with. And uh, I believe the women will I believe that, we, that the sport itself will be reliant as the years go by on, 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 the, on the women participation as well as the men. I'm a very sentimental type of person and I, I am very much aware of the value of the women I have had throughout my life, from the time I was a kid to the, to the present time. There's different women coming into, you know, into it and it, it uh, just seems so remarkable that these kind of things could happen. Now, of course, I've lost so many loved ones, wonderful, wonderful people. And the, the fact is that I, I hope that I'm going to be reuni reunited with them sometime. This is my first wife, Isabel, as, who as a child I fell in love with as a kid. From the time I was about 10 or 11, we, went, we used to sit with each other at the local Saturday afternoon matinees when we were still going to school. When we left school, we parted. We went our different ways. I met a girl called Enid Wagner 
and I fell in love with her. That was in 1939. We got engaged in 1941 and I went, I joined the Navy. The world was in an uproar at that particular time. People were just different, shall we say. Now, Ina and I decided that we would call off our engagement until such time as we could do something about it. That was in 1942. So we broke off the engagement. During the war years, I met my old girlfriend from way back, my school girlfriend. I made up with her again. We were married in 1944. And we uh, had 20 years of happy marriage. She was taken away with a disease called nephritis, which is a disease of the kidneys, which they couldn't do anything about. My only child was born while I was playing football in, in New Zealand. I haven't forgotten that. That's my daughter, myself. That was when I went over to England. I put football before my, the rest of my family life. And uh, I don't dwell on it, but uh, I'm very conscious of the fact that I should have given a little more attention to her. As I say, Isabel passed away in 1962, and I was married to, to Phyllis in 1966. My lovely Phyllis, so from, from America. So and we had 42 years of wonderful, wonderful, happy life. And she passed away uh, 13 years ago now. Phyllis died and Enid came back from 62 years later and came into my life again. I received a phone call from a lady asking me would I go to a reunion of the Meridans RSL Yoga set. And she said to me, there is a lady that I've contacted. She lives in a retirement village at Cromer and she would like to come along too. Her name is Enid Wagner. My old girlfriend from 62 years before. I'd often wondered whatever had happened to Enid. And here it was. She was, she was then in her mid eighties. So too was I. And we met under the big clock at Central Station where everybody in our youth used to meet. We, 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 we never married. We never ever slept together. But it, it was an amazingly close relationship that we had. Twin 12 years we were spared and we had a lovely time. And uh, about eight years ago, we, came, we both came into, into, into this village. We both had our individual uh, units and uh, we were so, so happy. She developed dementia and she passed away in, in January of this year. And at 99 years of age as I was when, when Ian had passed away, that my life is in that direction is, is finished, you know. So uh, there we are. I don't think the good old days were ever good. Uh, the 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 the, uh, the uh, average lifespan was very much less, probably fifty or sixty. Now a lifespan goes up to somewhere in the late eighties, and people are living not only longer, but they're living much healthier than they were 
going back 100 years, for instance, at the time that I was born, uh, I, I've, I've had a wonderful life and I wonder if I could say the same if I was stayed in that old town in Lancashire working in a cotton mill. What? <laughs>